We have been interested in habits for a long time, and the reason is that so much of our lives, actually, we are operating almost on autopilot. In our lab, we're trying to figure out what the basis is of those habits, and so it was a wonderful time when Teresa de Rochers came to the lab. I'm interested in habits and how you form habits, and a lot of people study bad habits, such as addiction. I'm interested in the kinds of good habits that you have in your everyday life. So for example, how you get to work in the morning. You generally will pick a route, and then you'll go on that route again and again and again, and you'll optimize that route. And I'm interested in how you do that, and then how you optimize it. So in this study, we were interested in having animals form their own habits similar to how you and I would form habits. And the way we did this is we gave animals a grid of dots to look at, a grid of nine dots, and all they had to do was look around this grid to find a rewarded target. And the reason why they form their own habits is because they had a lot of time to do this, and they could look around in whatever way they wanted to. So what the animals did is they made their own habit. They made their own way of getting to work as if work was finding that rewarded dot. And what we could then use this for is then being able to record in the monkey's brain what was going on in the circuitry that was underlying the formation of those habits. In this study, we were interested in recording from the striatum because the striatum is implicated in sequences and in habit formation. Previous work in the lab had examined how monkeys do sequences of saccades that were instructed and that were overlearned. They found that there's this activity that comes at the beginning and at the end of the sequence. And we wanted to know if that was there from day one. So what we found is that neurons in the striatum come to actually develop that activity. And as the habits that the animal are doing are getting stronger, so too is that activity. Previously, with the same set of animals, we had done an in-depth look at their behavior and found that it was a notion of cost that could actually drive the habit formation. Specifically, what cost is for these animals is the total distance that their eyes travel as they're forming their, their own pattern. So when we recorded, that's one of the first things that we were looking for. Is this variable represented there? And it is. And it's represented very strongly at the end of trials. So just after the monkey finishes looking around and finding that rewarded target, that's exactly when cells are responding to the, the cost that the animal had on that particular trial. It's amazing to sit and listen to these cells as the animal is actually working and have here this giant burst of activity that's happening at the end of the trial. Ken Amamori was a postdoc in the lab when I was a graduate student and he was really key in figuring out a lot of the analyses that we had to do with this huge body of neurons that we had recorded. When we modeled the activity, we said, what other variables can explain the activity that's happening at the, in these neurons at the end of the trial? And we found that there is a representation of cost, as I mentioned, but also a representation of reward. We next wanted to know what happens to this representation while the animal is learning. And what we found is through over time, one of the populations of cells, the cells that respond to both cost and reward together, those cells are gradually refining their responses. So they're becoming more and more refined of exactly when they're firing at the end of the trial, and they're firing a bit more strongly. The animal's behavioral patterns are also getting more refined. They're becoming more and more habitual, becoming more and more ingrained and repetitive. And so these two things develop in parallel, and that strongly suggests that this development in the cells that are reflecting both the cost and the reward are participating in really driving the behavior and making that behavior efficient. Everybody probably has a situation where I have this series of things that I do every day and I'm going to be as efficient as possible. So whether it's your walk to work or whether it's I'm making my cup of coffee and I only want to have to open the cupboard once. You are going to be very efficient about how you do those things that you do all the time. And it feels very intuitive that some notion of how much effort do I put into this is part of how those behaviors get there. But nobody had really shown that before. So this is the first study that really shows what the underlying circuitry in the striatum could be doing in terms of forming those behaviors and supporting you becoming more efficient at those behaviors that you do every day.